In this video, we're going to look at an injury that affects the sheath that surrounds your Achilles tendon. Now, it goes by many names. It is sometimes called Achilles tendosynovitis, paratendosynovitis, Achilles paratendinopathy, or Achilles paratendinitis. Now, if you've been given any of these diagnoses, this video will apply to you. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Mareika. I'm one of the physiotherapists from TreatMyAchilles.com, where you can get online physiotherapy assessment as well as treatment of any type of Achilles injury, all done via video call. Have a look at the description of this video if you want a link to our website. So a quick look at the anatomy. If we look at the back of the calf, you have your gastrocnemius muscle and your soleus muscle, which merge into the Achilles tendon and then the Achilles tendon attaches onto the heel bone. Now, there's a sheath that surrounds the Achilles tendon called the paratendon. And in our body, our tendons have different types of sheaths that surround them. You get synovial sheaths that's filled with synovial fluid, and then you have ones that doesn't have fluid in it, like the paratendon. And this is why the term tenosynovitis isn't actually the correct term for this type of injury we're discussing today, because this is not a synovial sheath. It's a paratendon, it doesn't have fluid in it. So the more correct term for this is Achilles paratendinitis, or Achilles paratendinopathy. Anyways, that aside, this sheath is actually super flexible, so it can stretch two to three centimeters, and the whole idea is that it acts like a tunnel for the Achilles tendon to move in, so that it can move unrestricted. So imagine that the Achilles tendon has to slide past different bones, tendons, muscles, and there's a chance that any of those could, could catch it. But now because it's in the sheath, it can move smoothly up and down through that. The sheath also has quite a few blood vessels in it and it helps to supply the Achilles tendon with um, blood and nutrients and everything else. And it also have nerve endings. And you can see in this picture that it's a really fine sheath, but it does a really good job of allowing that Achilles tendon to move freely. So what is paratendonitis or tendinopathy? Well, Simply put, it's when something irritates the, the paratendon or the, the sheath that surrounds the Achilles tendon and now the Achilles tendon isn't able to move as freely in that sheath. And it can be, the normal causes is something like blunt trauma, so somebody knocks you on your Achilles tendon, um, or it can be that your shoe's rubbing on your tendon, it can be you overexerted yourself, so you did a sudden ramp up of training that um, work the Achilles tendon really hard, so things like lots of hill running or speed sessions. Perhaps you changed your shoes, you went into flatter shoes when you used to higher shoes, so that would put extra stretch and strain on it. It could be overstretching. Anything that affects the Achilles tendon and overwork the tendon or put extra pressure on it, whether that's direct compression or stretch, can cause this to get irritated. Now, paratendinitis can be divided into acute, or chronic. And the one's not more serious than the other, it's just about how long they've been present for, because then you have different symptoms and different things happening in that area. So for acute, we're looking at an injury that's younger than three months. So it happened quite recently, in the last week or two. And at that point, you usually see an acute inflammatory reaction in that paratenum, and that causes fluid to move into the area, and that causes pain and stiffness and the tendon isn't as free to move. And usually at this point, what you notice is that the, your pain gets worse with movement. So where with Achilles tendinopathy, actually your pain, it feels uncomfortable to start moving, but as you get going, things start to feel better. With paratendinitis, it can feel that, oh, the more I move, the more uncomfortable it gets, actually. Then you have the stiffness, you can get crepitus or crackling, or you know, like it feels like fine bubble wrap popping um, when the tendon moves. And that's just because of the fluid in there. And this is specific for the acute phase especially. And if you look at it, you'll notice that there may be diffuse swelling, like in this picture, that the whole tendon looks swollen. Now, this is different from Achilles tendinopathy, where usually with Achilles tendinopathy, you can see a swollen area, but it's very prominent in a part of the tendon. It's not like this diffuse whole tendon that's swollen. Um, and if you test it, if you move your foot up and down, that swelling, that diffuse swelling stays in the same place. It doesn't move. It just stays swollen in that same area. 
Whereas if you have that nodule on your Achilles tendon from Achilles tendinopathy, that nodule moves with the tendon as it slides. But because this is the sheath, it just kind of stays where it is. Now that's for the acute phase. If it enters the chronic phase, you actually don't have a lot of swelling anymore. So the swelling settles down, you don't have that acute inflammation anymore. In fact, there's very little inflammation present at that point, but you usually then get a thickening of the paratendon or that sheath, and you get adhesions between the sheath and the Achilles tendon. So now it's these adhesions that stops the tendon from moving freely. At this point, the crepitus usually also decreases quite a bit, and it is just the discomfort that remains with movement. So how do you diagnose this and how do you treat it? Well, diagnosis wise, you can usually diagnose it through taking a thorough history and just looking at the patient and what hurts and how they present. So what we're listening for in the history is things that tells us that the Achilles tendon was overexerted. Now, a lot of things will overlap with Achilles tendinopathy, Achilles tears and Achilles tendon, um, paratendinitis. They have a lot of the same factors in the history and a lot of the same symptoms as well. And that's why you can't just listen to one thing. You have to compare the whole history and all the details. And that's why it's useful to see somebody who's experienced in diagnosing these things because they know what to listen out for and mark off um, in their mental tick sheet to get to the diagnosis. Um, but then also you want to look at the signs that you can see, like the diffuse swelling, or whether there's just a nodule, which would be more Achilles tendinopathy. And in the case of tennis in, uh, paratendinitis, it could be a little bit red, it could be a little bit swollen, um, it could be hot to the touch, but again, that can be true for bursitis, so it all depends on the area where it happens, and it can be true for things like gout, for instance. So it's all about taking a thorough history of the patient and listening to all of the factors involved. Now, scans may be useful, but they're not really necessary. They are only necessary if you don't make progress with your treatment or there are certain things like tears or things that needs to be excluded. Type of scans that can be useful for this is an ultrasound scan will show it up. It will show in the acute stage the, the fluid in the paratenin or it will show in the more ongoing stage, you can see the thickening of the paratenin. But also MRI scans is useful for this. Now, in case you're wondering, it's actually quite common to have paratenonitis in combination with other types of Achilles injuries. Because simply put, if you're gonna injure the sheath, it's very likely that you're also gonna injure the tendon. And it's quite common for it to be irritated if you have Achilles tendinopathy, it can be irritated if you've got a tear, it can be, injured by itself, or it can be injured if you have like bursitis, anything that would have irritated those structures can potentially also irritate the sheath. Now this may sound a bit complicated and you may be wondering, so how are you gonna know what's wrong with me then if it can be one of so many things or in combination with other things? Well, it's actually quite easy to diagnose it and to understand what's wrong if you have the experience of listening to everything, but it, the key lies into taking a thorough history of everything and understanding all the symptoms that's affecting it and testing movements and really looking at your patient. So even though it sounds complicated, it's not if you're doing a thorough assessment. Okay, so how do you treat this? Well, it's basically a three-step process. It's the same as you would use for Achilles tendonitis or tendinopathy. And that's why it's not that difficult to treat both conditions at the same time. The first step is to allow it to calm down. Now, a big mistake people often make is that when you get injured, you're so motivated to get better because it's usually derailing your training that you go on the internet and you see, oh, I've got to do this stretch and that exercise and they want to start with them today. But in that acute phase, this injured area is now overworked and it just needs a bit of a break so that the body can get rid of everything that's been irritating it, and just calm down. So avoid rehab exercises during the initial stage. Don't be too aggressive with anything and get guidance from a physiotherapist so that they can help you understand when the correct time is to start rehab exercises again. Now, there's several things you can do in your day to help reduce the load on the injured tendon and the injured sheath. And some of the most common things or the easiest things to do is just to avoid flat shoes because when you walk around in flat shoes there's a bit more stretch and compression between the sheath and the tendon and that can 
cause extra irritation. So if you put your foot in a shoe that has a slight heel on them, like running shoes normally works well, or you even place some extra heel inserts into the shoes, obviously just do it both sides so they're equal, that can just help that area to not take so much strain and help it calm down more quickly. But also, you will have to reduce your activities for a short period of time. And this doesn't mean you have to rest completely. In fact, if you keep very, very still and don't try to move at all, you're gonna feel worse for it. You need movement to help your circulation and keep you just going. So you have to stay as active as you can, but without increasing your symptoms. And this means that perhaps if you find that you can run, but if you go above 5Ks at the moment, that really causes trouble, stick to less than that. If you find that, oh, actually I can't run without it being uncomfortable afterwards, then you may have to supplement or substitute running for different activities like cycling or slow walking or something like that for a short period of time. So adapt your activities. It may also just mean that if you want to go for a walk, don't walk as fast. Fast walking causes a lot more strain on that area than slow walking, for instance, or avoid hills. So there are plenty of different ways that we can adapt activities um, to help your tendon and your sheath recover while you actually stay active. And that's one of the things that we always try to do for our patients. You may actually also benefit from anti-inflammatory medication in this instance. Because this is an acute inflammatory reaction in the sheath, and you can see on that picture I showed earlier how swollen it can be, that is an over-inflammatory reaction that can eventually lead to adhesions. So if we can limit the amount of inflammation and calm it down more quickly, that can be really useful. Now, if you've listened to other videos that we've made, you'll say that, but you said don't use anti-inflammatory medication for at least tendinitis or tendinopathy. Yes, we did. But if the tendon sheath is that inflamed, then they, is, they are actually an option. So no treatment is ever an strict never. It all depends on the situation. And in this situation, anti-inflammatories may be useful. But always ask your doctor before you use them because they may not be good in your case. The second step is to identify the cause. And the reason for this is you need to address the cause if you want to not have this injury again. Now, the cause may be that you're overtrained. You simply had training errors, that you do too much of the same type of exercise, too much um, high intensity, perhaps too much hill running, or just too many races in a short period of time. It could be that actually you didn't do any sport. You simply changed your shoes, went from hill shoes to flat shoes. Or it could be that it's part of how your body moves. So you may need orthotics because it's overstraining from too much pronation, or it could be your movement patterns. A physiotherapist can assess those for you and help you understand what is your main causes that needs to be addressed. And part of this can be simply habit change and part of it can be included in your rehab program. That brings us to step three, which is gradual loading. So we've had the karma down and we've had to identify the cause, and now we've got to start loading it again. So it's never useful to just calm it down and offload it for extended periods of time. Proper offloading where you do very little activity should only last a few days, maybe a week or two. And after that, you should be slowly introducing load again. The way that you increase load on the paratenin is exactly the same as you would do for at least tendinopathy. So it's through increasing your activities slowly. So thinking about walking endurance, running endurance, all of those things very, very slowly ramped up, but also the typical type of exercises like calf raises. And we've made a whole video about that for at least tendinopathy. So I'm not gonna go into the details here because it's exactly the same things. I'll link to that video in the description of this one. But the big difference with the exercise aims here is that if you have a exclusive paratendinitis, so nothing else is injured, just the sheath is irritated versus a tendinopathy. With a tendinopathy, the idea with the loading is to strengthen the tendon. With a paratendinitis, it's to slowly increase the load to see what it can tolerate at this point, because it won't be able to tolerate high loads, and this will help you to avoid flare-ups if you do it in a very step-based manner. But the good news is the recovery phase or the recovery time for exclusive paratendinitis is usually shorter than 
uh, at least in anopathy, because you don't have that strength aspect that needs to build. If you can calm it down properly in that initial stage, you can actually reload it relatively quickly again, and your recovery time can be a few weeks or maybe a couple of months. But if you have Achilles tendinopathy in combination with paratendinitis, it will obviously take longer because now you've got to also treat the Achilles tendon. This all sounds quite easy, but I know some of you listening to this video will be thinking, I've had mine for years. This has stuck around and I can't get rid of it. Well, if it hasn't worked, if the offloading hasn't worked and the calming it down and the reloading hasn't worked, then there are other options. And some of these include injections. So you could get a corticosteroid injection into the sheath, but important, it's not into the tendon, it's into the sheath and it has to be done by a skilled professional who actually does it under ultrasound guidance who can look at where it's being injected specifically. And you have to be quite careful with your rehab for a few weeks after that to make sure that you strengthen everything up properly because there's always a risk with rupture um, after you've had steroids. But if you've got chronic inflammation that doesn't want to calm down, doesn't want to react to anything else, a corticosteroid injection may be a useful option here. Other options injection wise is that they do a high volume injection where they just use a high volume of fluid to try and break down those adhesions that form in ongoing cases. But then also surgery is an option here. And with surgery they go in and remember I said in the, in the chronic case, you've got those adhesions and the thickening of the paratendon and stuff actually attaching onto the Achilles tendon. They just go in and they loosen the tendon so that it's allowed to smoothly move again. And they tend to do that through um, keyhole surgery, but these days they also tend to do it through Tenex and Tenjet, which is minimally invasive and it seems to work really well for this. So surgery is definitely an option for chronic cases if it didn't, doesn't want to calm down and you've had it for a long time and it's just really stopping your progress. But you must have tried the other things first and have had scans to show that this is actually your problem, then it may be an option. Now, I'm anticipating that quite a few of you are going to ask me in the comments, oh, what about friction massage and breaking down adhesions with massage? Will that help paratendinitis? Very likely not, because there isn't really any evidence that it can break down adhesions. And especially if you're going to try and do it in the acute phase, it is likely just going to increase the amount of inflammation and things you have. So if you want to try it, Definitely not during the acute phase, for not for the first three months then, because it may just increase your symptoms. But you could try it if it's a chronic, fa chronic phase where there's not a lot of swelling and it's calmed down and it's been present for longer than three months. Then you could possibly try it. There's no research to show that it works, but definitely don't do it in the acute phase. Brilliant. Hope you found that useful. Now remember, if you need more help with an Achilles injury, you're welcome to consult one of the team via video call. The link to the website is in the description of this video. Take care.